Most foods that we eat have a combination of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, along with fiber, minerals, and other nutrients. In this video, we will focus on carbohydrates such as starches and sugars in our foods to understand how they are related to the rise and fall of blood glucose levels. Let's say you eat an apple. Starches and sugars present in the apple are digested or broken down into simple sugars such as glucose, which is then absorbed from the intestine and enters the bloodstream. A high blood glucose level signals the pancreas to secrete insulin into the blood. Muscle, fat, and other cells in the body require insulin for taking in glucose from the blood to provide energy for movement, cellular functions, and growth. Any excess glucose is stored in cells as glycogen and used later. Another signal that prepares our body to produce insulin comes from intestines that are full of food. This signal is delivered to the pancreas via a protein hormone called GLP-1. The signal itself is naturally regulated, meaning after a few minutes of action, GLP-1 is destroyed by an enzyme called DPP-4. This ensures that the pancreas does not overproduce insulin. Cells in our brain require a steady blood glucose level to function normally. To ensure normal brain function, our body stores glucose in the form of glycogen. Liver has the largest store of glycogen in our body. During times of fasting, a hormone called glucagon directs conversion of stored glycogen into glucose to maintain the blood glucose levels. During extreme starvation, the liver is also capable of converting protein and lipid building blocks into glucose. Another organ that plays an important role in managing blood glucose levels is the kidney. Its normal function is to filter out waste materials from our blood and flush it out as urine. During this process, glucose in the blood is also filtered out. Our body has a mechanism to reabsorb this glucose by a special glucose transporter protein. This ensures that there is no wastage. A quick finger stick test can be used to measure the blood glucose levels at any given time. Blood glucose levels below 70 mg per deciliter is considered too low and should be addressed immediately, while levels higher than 200 mg per deciliter about 2 hours after a meal is considered too high. Prolonged periods of high blood glucose levels can cause glucose to stick to proteins in the blood. The amount of sugar bound to hemoglobin provides an assessment of the average level of blood glucose over an extended period of time. This measure is called hemoglobin A1c or HbA1c. High numbers indicate inadequate management of blood glucose levels. So one of the goals in diabetes treatment is to reduce the HbA1c numbers. Diabetes is either caused by the absence of insulin, inadequate levels, or improperly functioning insulin. The main symptom seen in diabetes is high blood glucose levels. In order to maintain the blood glucose levels within a narrow range, individuals living with diabetes can change their diet and lifestyle. Changing diet means the amount of carbohydrates that enter the bloodstream is limited, Changing lifestyle or adding exercise can help use more of the glucose from the blood. If no insulin is produced by the body, such as in type 1 diabetes, the individual has to take insulin injections. However, if insulin is produced in the body, a number of different approaches can be used to manage blood glucose levels. Usually, the first medication given to an individual diagnosed with diabetes is a biguanide called metformin. Although the mechanism of action of this medication is not fully understood, it is known to decrease the amount of glucose released from liver. Some reports suggest that it increases the efficiency of glucose uptake by 
fat and muscle cells by increasing insulin sensitivity. Both activities reduce blood glucose levels. Other approaches to reduce addition of glucose to the bloodstream include blocking the digestion of carbohydrates by a class of medications called alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. So the undigested sugars are removed in the bowels. Another approach is blocking reabsorption of glucose from the kidney by a class of medications called sodium glucose transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitors. These medications help flush out excess glucose in the urine. Several classes of medications increase insulin secretion. For example, sulfonylureas and miglitinides act on the pancreas to increase insulin secretion, whereas thiazolidine dions or TZDs increase insulin sensitivity of cells and the efficiency of glucose uptake by them. The class of medications called gliptins are DPP-4 inhibitors that block the function of the regulator DPP-4, thereby prolonging the life of the GLP-1 hormone, which in turn signals increase in insulin production. Synthetic GLP-1 analogs are stable molecules that mimic the function of the GLP-1 hormone. They promote satiety and can lead to weight loss. Some of these medications can be taken just once a week, making them user-friendly. Diabetes is a progressive metabolic disorder. The first medication prescribed after diagnosis is commonly metformin. Over time, one or more other classes of medications may be added to the treatment plan for better management of blood glucose levels. In really advanced stages, the pancreas may stop making insulin altogether. At this stage, insulin injections may be necessary for managing blood glucose levels. To learn more about diabetes and its various treatment approaches in molecular detail, visit PDB 101.